Hey, this is Alex from PLR. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. I just wanted to let you know that we have a five-part series on the history of the German Social Democratic Party up on our Patreon for Patreon backers. You can have access to all five episodes and more for as little as a dollar a month pledge. Uh, but here as a little treat is episode one on the history of the German Social Democratic Party. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PLR podcast where we seek to build a network of leftists in the so-called state of Rhode Island and someday win local power. If you're listening to this, that means that you are a Patreon uh, subscriber. I want to say thank you so much for the contribution that you're making per month uh, for this podcast so that we can continue to bring content to you. Uh, and I, I think I have something really special in store for you um, f- for the next few episodes, at least that I'm doing alone. This is a, the first of a five-part series on what was and I think remains one of the largest socialist movements in history, and that is the German Social Democratic Party of the early 20th century. This is where a lot of the uh, theorists that you've heard about, like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Kautsky, this is where they came from, this is where they got their start. So the history of this party, uh, at least from my opinion, is really important to us as leftists so that we can learn from the mistakes and the successes of, of these early parties. So again, this is the first of a five-part series, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm using a hodgepodge of my own studies in a work uh, by a seminal historian of Germany and Austria named Karl Shorsky. Uh, he wrote a, a book on what's called the Great Schism in 1955. Shorsky was a professor at Princeton, born into the Bronx, into a family that supported German immigrants in the early 20th century. His father was a, a banker, specifically catering towards new I- immigrants that came, uh, that were fleeing Europe in the early 20th century. Uh, Karl Shorsky was primarily interested in the intersection of psychology and history, uh, but he wrote his dissertation, which became this book, uh, about the theoretical issues that fractured the German Social Democrats at a time at, at that time the largest socialist movement the world had seen. But the timing of his book, 1955, is no coincidence. For Shorsky and for others, the East German Communist Party, which owed its loyalty to the Soviet Union, uh, particularly Stalin's Soviet Union, was an anomaly of sorts that people like Shorsky wanted to understand. He believed that by studying the feuds within the German Social Democratic Party, uh, particularly the feuds before World War I, he could find the roots of what became the German Communist Party, the one that owed its loyalty to the, the, so, the Soviet Union. So we have to understand this book in both context and as a treatise on how Shorsky and others wanted to understand the events of Germany before, during, and after World War II. And as we'll see throughout this series, a lot of the themes that become important in World War II, nationalism, militarism, uh, really weigh heavy on the German Social Democrats, and they really influence the rise and fall of certain characters in this history. This series, this five-part series, is going to look chronologically at what Shorsky and others called the Great Schism of German Social Democracy. My focus is going to be on the debates and the history because I think that there's a lot of learning potential from knowing more than the factoids that Wikipedia provides. In our own world, there were party organization might be more useful now more than ever. Uh, And we have to have some kind of conceptual understanding of the socialist efforts that came before us. And that includes whether you're a socialist, a communist, an anarchist, or even just a mild leftist. The problems that we deal with today and the disagreements that fracture the left, that they have historic precedent. Uh, and they've never been totally resolved. And so, if anything, this short series should be a lesson on the themes that we should begin to think about if we are to have a genuine, lasting leftist movement. This long history of the German Social Democratic Party really starts with the unification of Germany in the 1870s. Uh, 
After the European revolutions of 1848, the lower middle class retreated from radical politics and sided with the conservatives to create a massive coalition of reactionary forces. Basically, the bourgeoisie of 1848 became afraid of radicals because of what they had seen, particularly even after 1848 with the Paris Commune. Uh, they were afraid of, of, of radicalism within the workers' movement, and so they sided, they began to side with conservative powers, even in Germany, as well as in France. German socialists formed a labor party in 1875, but it didn't last long because it was divided between those with a Marxist revolutionary gospel, those uh, radicals, and those whose radicalism was more tamed and conciliatory, those conciliatory, those who wanted to work with the system. The people who were more cautious of their radicalism acted for a reason. They weren't um, so tamed because they were afraid necessarily. Between 1878 and 1890, Bismarck, who was then Chancellor of Germany, and the forces of order imposed a number of strict anti-socialist laws uh, in, in an effort to root radical socialism out of the German Reich. Instead, all, of these law, all these laws did was push socialists further underground. To survive, the party had to be conspiratorial, and it's at this point that members of the party, like Karl Kautsky, who will come up frequently in this and later episodes, reaffirm their commitment to social revolution, that is, the actual act of revolution and not just reform. And finally, in 1891, the anti-socialist laws were lifted and the socialists, newly able to convene public publicly, came back to the drawing table at Erfurt. What became known as the Erfurt sy Synthesis uh, was engineered largely by Karl Kautsky, the party's, at that time the party's foremost theoretician uh, and editor of one of its major newspapers. The Erfurt program called for essentially two things. First, it recognized that capitalism was developing and, in its way, increasing the misery of the working class and the lower middle class. Contrary to what some of the more tame socialists were saying, uh, they were arguing that capitalism uh, was actually making living standards better for some people. The Erfurt pr program agreed, was an agreement with socialists of the new party, that actually it was increasing the misery of the working class. The newly reformed party had a few objectives for um, the post-Bismarckian German Reich. First, universal suffrage. They wanted to make sure that uh, women, in particular, were voting, and also uh, all men, property and non-property. Second, self-determination in the Reich, that is, for local lands, uh, L-A-N-D-E-S, to have uh, their own determination within the German uh, Empire, or German state. And three, direct election of officials. Four, a direct graduated income tax. That is essentially what we're arguing for today, that will, uh, people pay according to their income. The program at Year 4 was was designed for a non-revolutionary period because the party was still weak and needed to regain influence among the workers. As Karl Shorsky wrote, so long as the German state kept the working class in a pariah status, and so long as the working class able to extract a share of the material blessings of a vig vigorous expanding capitalism was not driven by revolt, the Erfurt synthesis would hold. So that meant that the radicalism could be tamed because people were experiencing uh, some relief, some benefits. But across Germany, social democracy looked different. In the north, where industrialization was most powerful, workers were more radical because there were more of them. There were more industrial enterprises. There were more factories. And their struggle against capitalism was more apparent in the south, However, industrialization was slow, and there was a firm liberal tradition amongst the workers. It was in the South that reformism, as it came to be called, first appeared. For more about reformism, we'll get into that here because it's a major part of the German social democratic schism.
But if you wanted to hear more on that quickly, you can go back to previous episodes, the one on Rosa Luxemburg's social revolution or reform. Trade unions now were another major factor in this early history influencing the rise of reformism. In the late 19th century, trade unions in Germany recognized the need for a centralized apparatus because employers formed their own organization and employers' unions, which were powerful enough to eliminate the effects of labor protest. The trade unions didn't like radicalism because it scared off the workers, they thought. So the answer for the centralized trade unions was to avoid political involvement altogether. So here what we have are two sort of branches of German social democracy forming. There's the party radicals. Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Kotsky are the two embodiments of the party radicals. There's the party uh, reformers, who we'll get into. Edward Bernstein is one of them. And then there's trade unions who exist on their own and are largely afraid of the radical wing of the Social Democratic Party. Kautsky and them recognized the danger of a politically apathetic working class. And together with the trade unionists, the party organized what were called the two pillars theory, where the trade unionists would control the power of the purse to help mitigate the effects of striking. The party would participate, would participate in the political aspect. It would handle the politics of, of, of the working class. And this, after this two pillars theory is agreed upon and articulated, is when our old friend Edward Bernstein comes into the picture. Shorsky writes that Bernstein launched his attack against the most fundamental of Marx's propositions concerning capitalist development, that the incompatibility of the systems of production and the forms of exchange produced growing anarchy in the capitalist economy. Where Marx saw growing anarchy, Bernstein saw order. Extrapolating from the absence of any world economic crisis the two decades since 1873, Bernstein advanced the theory that capitalism had developed a capacity for adjustment, which would rule out major economic crises in the future. So Bernstein was saying that capitalism, the contradictions of capitalism that Marx talked about, were eradicating themselves, and that there was more of a need for reformism. I talked a lot about Bernstein in the half episode on Rosa Luxemburg, uh, so, so suffice it to say here that Bernstein's revisionism focused on the ethical side of human action rather than the material or traditional Marxist side of the debate. He went against traditional Marxism by arguing that revolution itself, social revolution, was unnecessary and, the, and working within the existing state institutions was a way of changing the social base of uh, social organization. Now, because capitalism was increasing in power and durability, Bernstein argued a genuine revolution was virtually impossible. You can imagine that Karl Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg, among others, recognized a real danger in, in Bernstein's reformism and tried to argue that the contradictions of capitalism were actually sharpening. And again, if you want to hear Rosa Luxemburg's specific retort to Bernstein, Go back to a uh, previous PLR episode in our regular feed. Uh, in, the, in reality, Luxembourg and Kautsky argued that capitalism was not in decay. Uh, but the articulation of reformism itself had already set the party on the path of schism. Radicals like Luxembourg became more entrenched in party discipline and a strong central authority and reformists maintained a more federalist adherence to party structure. And Shorsky argues in his book that the reformist adherence to a more federalist party structure was merely just a strategy for reformists to gain a foothold of power within the party, to overthrow the radical wing of the party. As Shorsky argues, the trade unionists, like the Southern Social Democrats, were finding the revolutionary character of the party a handicap in recruitment, their natural tendency was, therefore, to emphasize only the pursuit of the workers' material interests and to leave the propagation of the socialist gospel to the party. So you can see this splinter starting to happen. Trade unionists and reformists, the Bernsteinian people, are on one side, and the radicals, 
on the other. And there's also a party executive, which we'll get into. But the Russian Revolution of 1905 really is what sort of lit the flame under this entire emerging feud. It shook up the priorities and purpose of the German Social Democratic Party fundamentally. Now, in 1905, after a crushing defeat at the hands of Japan, a lingering agrarian crisis, nationalities crisis, Russian labor organized a series of strikes and actions in St. Petersburg. To be clear, the revolutionaries were not only socialists or anarchists, but educated petite bourgeois forces that demanded constitutional monarchy for Russia and the creation of a legislative Duma, which would be the sort of sort of Russian equivalent of a parliament, although not exactly. The German socialists looked at these developments as proof positive of the effect of radical organization, but it also hardened the resolve of employers in Germany who formulated the mass lockout and formed employers' unions, turning former moderate socialists towards the radical camp. So actually, while the employer class sought to lay the hammer down on workers following the Russian Revolution, it actually had the opposite effect of turning a lot of moderates toward the radical wing. The cost of living was rising in 1904 to 1905, and the immediate need to increase wages became felt throughout Germany. At this point, discussion of the mass strike became came to the center of party politics. If you don't know what the mass strike is, it's a it's a leftist uh, sort of mythos of uh, a massive workers strike that will paralyze industry in throughout the world if it's international or throughout the nation if it's uh, particular to a nation. Russia had successfully organized a mass strike at least in St. Petersburg in 1905. So the topic of the mass strike as party platform or as a, a party tool, tool for socialists, came into discussion in Germany. On the one hand, radicals called for a strike in order to cripple employers and force demands like increased wages. But on the other hand, party moderates sought to use the mass strike as a parliamentary tactic in order to win seats in the government. So the radicals wanted to use it in order to make demands, and the moderates wanted to use it in order to make threats toward, uh, towards uh, parliament. In 1905, coal workers in the Ruhr Basin started to strike. But this strike, even though it took influence from the Russian strikes in 1905, still looked different from its Russian counterpart in that, or it was more spontaneous than the, the Russian organized strike. Unfortunately, the success and the increasing radicalism of the labor movement scared trade union leaders into more cautionary roles, fearing that the radicalism would undermine their possibility for real concessions. Leading this argument was, of course, our old friend Edward Bernstein. I, th I have this, I'm, I'm willing to put a bounty out for any researcher who can find, for me, a document in the German archives that places Bernstein as some kind of agent for the German government or something like that, because his role, as we're seeing throughout this history, is fundamentally to upset the agreements within the party. And it's strange how Bernstein's theories today, the way that he saw capitalism developing, the way that he sought to get workers' power, actually holds a lot of weight today. Um, as I said, the DSA of the United States' platform is closer to Edward Bernstein than it is to Kautsky or, or Luxembourg. But anyway, tension peaked in 1905 between radicals and moderates, culminating in the Jena Conference in September, so that is September 1905. August Babel, the chairman of the party, presided over one of the most divided party meetings to date. But in the end, the party agreed to Babel's compromise that officially considered revolution a defensive act, not an act in and of itself, positioning the mass strike not as a means of revolution, but as a defensive weapon to safeguard the victories of labor. 
Thus, the party came to dictate the value of something that Luxembourg and other radicals deemed inherently spontaneous, that is, direct action. The party was trying to dictate the correct use of direct action. Still, Shorsky, our historian, considered this a victory for the radicals because they were granted power over the trade unions to determine the use and when it's proper to use a mass strike. In other words, the party got to determine when a mass strike was appropriate. And this, according to Shorsky, is a victory for the party over trade unions. But the radical victory didn't last long. Shorsky calls the next party conference in Mannheim a counter-revolution of trade unionists. Here, Kautsky tried to argue that the party took precedent, precedent over trade unions who were transient. They were fleeting. They weren't as consistent as the party. But even though much of the party agreed with Kautsky, the party executive, that is August Bebel and others, quickly moved to defang Kautsky's point, as they feared that losing the support of trade unions would be the consequence. Thus, in their fears of losing labor support, the party reinforced the tactic of reformism, thereby making the center of power within the labor movement the trade unions and not the party. So as you can see, there's sort of this pull and tug between trade unions and radicals going on, particularly uh, during and after 1905. And you can imagine that the result of this pull and tug, it's going to be something that plays itself out throughout all five of these episodes that I'm doing. Shorsky's overall thesis is that the history of the Social Democra Democratic Party at the time corresponds with wider German history. And he's right to argue that by 1907, with Germany racing to become a world power and the isolation of the, the Kaiser from his allies, major German questions continued to split the party, not just the argument over trade unions and the party, which all these things are involved in. The most important and the most long-running was definitely what was called the national question. Nationalities questions are ones that plague leftist movements in multi-ethnic states from the Soviet Union to even the United States. And as we'll see, it had the power to kill an effective coalition of labor. Nationalism became a powerful force in the early 20th century. I mean, if you wanted to look at the, the history of nationalism, of course it goes back to uh, the 19th century, the 1800s, but it really becomes a massive political force in the 20th century. And in German political history, the national question in 1907 convinced enough liberals to switch allegiance to the right in order to safeguard German interests at home and abroad. The party had not articulated a stance toward German militarism until this point. And Karl Liebknecht and Kurt Eisner both took leading roles in pressing the party to make a more vigorous anti-war platform, which makes sense as leftists, right? We, we assume as leftists that we're all anti-war, but as we'll see, this topic of war is a little bit more complicated than we like to give it credit for in these historical junctures. But the fact of the matter is that workers made up the bulk of the party, and nationalism was appealing to many workers who had served in the army. Party executive August Bebel uh, had to be careful with how the party articulated its stance towards German militarism. And in an effort to compromise, as he was always seeking to do, Babel argued that the party should back improvements in the army, thereby endorsing fiscal support for military reforms. So the question here is really complicated. What you have essentially is the German Empire asking for uh, the Reich to asking for um, the, the German legislator to vote on increasing the military budget of the Reich. And at, as you would expect, socialists should reject that. But because the majority of workers, the backbone of the socialist movement, are also members of the German military, the party couldn't just dismiss increasing the the benefits of being in the army, financial support for the military. 
because they would risk losing their worker support in the military or veteran support. All this came to a head at the Stuttgart Party Congress, where the topic of militarism and nationalism reigned supreme. It was there that the party, according to our historian Shorsky, revealed itself as the leader of the conservative forces of the international. It's here that the German Social Democratic Party, despite what Luxembourg, despite what Liebknecht, despite what Kotsky wanted, revealed itself to be the most reactionary socialist party, albeit the biggest, but the most reactionary in the world at that time. Precisely because it resisted a more radical policy against militarism, and it pressed for a fuller acceptance of colonialism, which it also thought increased the coffers of, of the German Empire. This was a major victory for trade unionists, revisionists, and the party executive at the expense of the radical wing, Luxembourg and Kautsky, who argued vigorously against uh, this party uh, decision. In the next part of this five-part series, we'll go over the consolidation of the right and the expansion of trade union influence and how the restructuring of the party served a death knell to party radicals. Thank you for listening. Thank you for contributing. A uh, special shout out to Tyler, to Jen, uh, to Phyllis, um, and anybody else who has backed our Patreon. We really appreciate it. Your money is going both towards helping to fund guests that come on, the organizations that come on, but also towards helping us get the technology that we need to record these episodes. And it's also compensating us for the work that we're doing. Even though we love it, we all work full-time jobs, and so it's, it can be very taxing. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I look forward to doing the next one. 